Some of you saw the sunset last night over the river, which is always beautiful. Today promises to be a nice, cool summer day here at Marist, so I hope you get to enjoy the, the outside as much as the speeches and the presentations inside. When we began planning this conference and trying to decide what themes were emerging that were of greatest importance to us, it became clear that we had to start discussing leadership in a more serious way. And this became clear because we are facing change, massive change and disruptive change. And as leaders, we felt that it's our responsibility not to just wait around and continuously reallocate resources or to be resolved to become the arbiters of who sacrifices what to whom, but to take a position of true leadership through research, education, application, and understanding to fill our collective responsibilities to create abundance through our work. What I know about everybody in the room is you're either a CIO, close to being a CIO, want to be a CIO, or want to be a leader. This means you have one thing, a bias towards action. And this is the first quality required in a leader. Without this, no amount of education or willingness or understanding can make up the deficit. But there is much more about leadership that we can learn. Through a deep dive into different types of leadership, that was what was necessary for this year's theme. What we will hear from the speakers who are joining us for the next two days is how action and intelligent risk is necessary to overcome fog and friction of organizational management. We will learn about controlling emotions to our benefit and advantage, thinking clearly through discomfort and anxiety, pushing the limit without actually breaking anything, and how others have persevered to lead their organizations to success. We will learn it isn't about requiring massive resources or the next best idea. In fact, sometimes it's just having the courage to make a decision. When the Confederacy was marching on Washington, D.C. during the Civil War, Union General McClellan had amassed the largest army, the most artillery, the largest store of musicians, and more mules than they could feed. Yet he remained on the banks of the Hudson, claiming he did not have enough resources to win. In a fit of anger, President Lincoln scratched out a short note. Dear General McClellan, if you aren't going to use the army, may I please have it back? True leadership reveals itself in seriousness and sometimes a little humor. And more recently, we saw the dot-com boom and then the bust. This taught us that going online to sell stuff could not succeed without a strong business plan and strong leaders to manage it. Ideas fail all the time. Leaders are required for success. As CIOs, many of us are entering what I call the sunny long afternoon of our careers. And what we, will believe, what we will leave behind speaks as much about our reputation now as what we have yet to achieve. So we've decided to dedicate this conference to tell our stories to each other, to listen to contemporary experts, share our experience with those who will replace us, learn new ways of thinking so our leadership does not become stale, and hopefully return home to use our new knowledge and new energy. With those thoughts, it's a pleasure to introduce you today to our first speaker, Jennifer Sertle is president and founder of Agility 3R. Agility 3R is an organizational effectiveness company that primarily focuses on the optimization of customer value by deploying leadership and facilitating wisdom across the entire value chain. She also is an internationally respected author and has written, book, written the book Strategy, Leadership, and the Soul. Jennifer has kindly provided copies of her book for the conference attendees, and they're located outside the theater. I've read this book. It's the reason why I invited Jennifer to come here. Um, it's an advantage that you will not have if you just go through traditional leadership training. It's exceptional, and I recommend that you pick up a copy, and perhaps even Jennifer would sign it for you if, uh, if you won't mind. Jennifer is a thought leader in the emerging field of corporate consciousness, the convergence of neuroscience and existential philosophy that fosters inspiration and creates strategic advantage that enhances value. Over the tw past 12 months, Jennifer's expertise and keen insights have dominated paradigm shifts in executive leadership, employee engagement, and shareholder responsibility in both publicly and privately held companies. Jennifer runs a business simulation strategy called Interplay that facilitates awareness and personal accountability and focuses on quantifying intangible assets and human capital. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Jennifer Sertle.
excellent. I'm originally from Denver, Colorado, and we have the Air Force Academy there. And from the moment I saw the campus and the moment we were greeted by the students, I felt as if we should call them the Marist Cadets. And so I thought we could start this morning with some acknowledgement for Bill and his remarkable team and the students that have been so gracious. So would you please stand? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Being a thought leader sometimes is scary because you're provocative, and sometimes being provocative um, makes you not um, welcome in some closer to home, if you will. So I'm going to be brave today, and I'm going to ask you to create some safety for me to be brave. I can't imagine speaking after Linda. You, Bill, did such a wonderful job as a great conductor, creating a fantastic platform in which I get to speak today. And I'm so excited after my talk for us to actually get some additional wisdom from Charles. And there's a master plan at play, and so it'll be really fun, really fun to watch. I'm an abstract thinker, and thus I'm an abstract speaker. I have a friend named Ned Kumar who says the future is about connecting the dots rather than focusing on the dots. I'm going to ask you, please apply that wisdom today as you hear me, because not everything I say will connect immediately. But I guarantee by the end of this time, you will fully understand what I have given you. To prepare for this program, I interviewed a cross-section of CIOs. I read Accenture's recent publication on what they've learned. I've read the Gartner Group's publication on what we've learned. And I have to say that as I was learning about the challenges that are facing you now, I got overwhelmed. I felt there was this vortex that was pulling me in to overwhelm. After all, knowledge has moved from being a solid to a, a liquid and now a gas. Instead of containing content, you, as the CIO, are now the container. So compassionately, I thought, if given an hour, what is it I can do to truly make a contribution? What can I do to help? And the genuine answer that came to me was to provide you with a mindset that will enhance your clarity in the midst of the chaos. So that's what I'm going to give you today as a mindset to support you. When Linda was talking, she was talking about the need and urgency of leadership, and she was talking about the uh, outcomes that you can foster, but she really didn't talk about you, the individual. And if you notice, the cover of our book is a lighthouse, because many MBA programs talk about strategy. Do they rarely talk about you, the leader? At the end of the day, life is not plug and play. Life is not case study. It's relevant what's real to you and what choices you have to make. So I thought, it sounds like you need some protection. But when I began in my interviews to use the word protection, I kind of got this kind of bravado, and we don't need protection, we protect people, right? And, um, and I thought, you know, there must be something about protection that touches some sort of nerve that, that response that I had gotten during those interviews gave me insight to the fact that you are a buffer and safe harbor for many, many complex, unresolved conflicts and challenges that need a place to live. So just for a moment, a mere hour, I wish you can take off that weight. I mean, I see this image of Atlas. You know, here's the world. Yeah, I'm holding it up. I'm holding it up, right? So for a mere hour, I would really, really love for you to take off that weight. Let your shoulders rest. And I'll provide you with a mindset and some tools. If you read the program, it said five tools. I read the spec. I'll deliver the spec. It's supposed to get some laughter. Is it just too early for laughter? OK. Thank you. Even if it was just to placate me. Thank you very much. Um, so let's, let's begin. Technology has become so integral to our life experience. And what's ironic is that I was thinking, how do you bridge existential philosophy and systems thinking in a relevant way that, that, that CIOs will not throw me out of the room and say, we need to work? And my four-year-old son 
believe it or not, gave me the most incredible gift. Here's the gift. I was dropping him off at school. He was four years old. He goes to preschool. And he says, Mommy, does your heart remote control people? Just want to let you have some time to let that in. <coughs> Mommy, does your heart remote control people? I, I was struck by how profound this statement was for several reasons. First, of course, the impact I have on my son and his view of my power, which is both wonderful and terrifying as a parent. The second was how pervasive technology is today for a four-year-old who's trying to figure out how to navigate and play games and how to love. So the wise message of how our temperament and being can influence power to create safety and trust in a room. And then the fact that we have impact from a distance. And then I did have someone, because I tend to get too cerebral, who said, you know, by the way, Jen, he really was just saying he's thinking about you when you're not there. <laughs> so once I recovered from the impact of his statement, I said, yes, I told him, absolutely. And your heart does too. And that is why it's so important that we're kind to one another. Your heart remote controls people. Why I felt, you know, besides me being a gushing proud mom and this picture of my son and, you know, there, there's a connection for all of us here. I thought this is the way to start connecting to you because it's why we're here, is that I believe every single person in this room believes that we're here because our future relies on the curiosity and passion of our next generation and the wise use of technology. Both. And I, I remember the echoes of Isaac Asimov's talk, where he, he, the quote that kind of echoes in my mind, the saddest aspect of life right now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. But you and I, you and I, are working to make sure the wisdom will be gathered as quick as the velocity of the use of technology. And that's why we're here. So I've been asked, Jennifer, what does Agility 3R mean? What are the three R's? And I will share that with you now. The first R is resilience. So I think about what is it I can do with individuals and organizations that's timeless? Meaning it, these things will not change regardless of how technology changes and as the global economy changes and as the world shrinks. I believe that these three, these three R's have been true forever and will continue to be true, even in augmented reality. So agility, three R. The first is resilience. And everything I do has both an interpersonal connection as well as a corporate connection. So at first, if resilience is really our ability to scale learning from failure in an individual, in a collective, in a group. I know many of you here are really wonderful about being in introspective and, and being strong and learning from your failure. But what we need to do a better job of is sharing the learning so that we, we, we collectively gather those lessons. And it was so beautiful to see Linda last night share that with a slide, that they had done that. They said, here's what we've learned, and here's where we failed. And it also means what you th would normally think it would mean, durability, flexibility, diversity, and, and, uh, and also um, connectivity. The more different life experiences that you've had, the more resilient you will be because you have a greater repertoire in which to draw upon. Okay. The second is responsiveness. And when I think about responsiveness, I really think about our ability as an individual or a collective to most accurately sense the entire ecosystem and make sustainable choices. Okay? So responsiveness is not about being available, right? I know a lot of people that think that if they're available, they're responsive. Responsiveness has to do with how accurately do you scan the macro and make choices that are based on an ecosystem as broad as you can comprehend. And then typically, what you would also think is perceptiveness, alertness, adaptability. And then finally, reflection, which I do believe 
is one of the biggest challenges in Western culture. Because I do believe that insight does come from data points, right? But there's someone that has to interpret the data. And I'm a big believer that open space and quiet is actually where insight occurs. And so we actually have to design reflection into our capacity model and not steal it away, but actually design it in. Because it's the ability of the individual or collective to build capacity of deep thinking and then what I'll call um, retro pattern recognition. And what I love about you all being here is that I know that you've had to make sacrifices to be here because you have deadlines, you have budget cuts, you have all those things. But what you knew is that you had to create space so that you could think. And you created that space, even with resistance. And, and I, I just want to really encourage you that you must continue to design that space in. It's critical for insight to occur. Again, reflection also means introspection, sense-making, insight, and foresight. And so that's what I stand for, and that's what I practice. I now want to tell you about the year 2005. I don't know if any of you have had those years where you're like, that, there's a particular moment in time, perhaps, that your entire life changed. And I will tell you, 2005 was that year for me. And the first was because I read Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat. And by show of hands, how many of you have read the world is flat. OK. Even, you know, I still, there are two books that I say that um, in our canon that, that I really think that from a context perspective are important for you to read. And also to have um, your, you know, anyone that's 20 or older, I think the two books that I really want to make sure people continue to read and keep present are The World is Flat and also Anne Rand's Atlas Shrugged. OK. Show of hands just for fun how many people have read Atlas Shrugged. OK, please, please put it on your reading agenda after you read Strategy, Leadership, and the Soul. <laughs> Thanks for laughing. OK, very good. Um, so what happened with um, Thomas Friedman and The World is Flat was that the context around how much things had changed and the beautiful articulation of that. And I literally was like Jenny Apple Appleseed because I bought 50 copies of that book. And I was running two CEO roundtables at that time. I made sure that everyone had the book. Now, I don't know if they read it or not. But I just really felt that it was really so important to do that. And, and the reason why is actually one page. And I'll show you the page. This is what I got from Thomas Friedman's The World is Flat. And it was on, um, on one of the floors in, in China. There was this thing. Every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up. It knows it must run faster than the fastest lion, or it will be killed. Every morning, a lion wakes up, and it knows it must outrun the slowest gazelle, or it will starve to death. It doesn't matter if you're a lion or a gazelle. When the sun comes up, you better start running. I don't know what it is about that statement, but it hit me hard. And what hit me hard wasn't the message about competition. I didn't get this about competition. What I got from this message was conditioning. Conditioning. We don't have to run, but we need to know if we need to run, we can. How are we going to build endurance if we don't practice being in great, great condition? And so that fundamentally changed my practice for myself and for the people that I worked with. And I think about the, the greatest analogy I can give to you is, you know, Linda talked last, last night about how much easier it was when Lou was teaching the elephant to dance because everyone knew that failure meant they would not have jobs. There was a real skin in the game and a real detriment. And she said last night, one of the hardest things is how to create that level of urgency when people are comfortable and you're succeeding, right? And so the challenge, and so I, you know, I want to connect that, and then also just say that the best analogy I can think of is at a, at a buffet. I don't like to eat at buffets because I don't have that much discipline. And I don't know many people who do. They can actually walk around the buffet and say, what kind of food is here, right? And let me select only the amounts and the choices that will truly nourish my long view, right? I don't think a lot of people do. And you know what? We live in a buffet information, anyone you want to meet. You know, eBay is now coming and shopping at your door, even if you don't want to. They're doing neuroscience on your habits so they know exactly your preferences, right? And, and so what we have to do is we have to say, we need to be in great condition so that we know what to select and in what amount.
to select it. It's really important that we practice discernment. And, and believe it or not, this all came from Thomas Friedman. So you can imagine um, the impact of that. The other thing that happened to me in 2005 is there was a, a gentleman in France who was an American citizen, but he loved living in France. And what he loved about France is that they were these salons, they call them salons, where eclectic people would meet and they would just have these great conversations. And so this gentleman uh, was a bit of an entrepreneur and a bit of an eclectic, I must say. And he had a group of 18 friends all over the world. And he said, you know what? I want to have a global conversation. I want to have a global salon. And so what he did is he had 18 of his friends invite anywhere from 7 to 10 people. And the people that were invited, we sent our curriculum vitae and what we were most passionate about. And they designed the entire conference from the people attending. And everyone there was either a panelist, a speaker, or a student. And, and that was such a beautiful experience around how you really should design around the people and the passion, which was great. So I think it was a miracle, because if I, if I noticed the people that were going to be there, I probably would have been too intimidated, honestly, because it was re remarkable that I was even there. But I was a speaker, and, and I was talking on, if you want to change the world, change your life, that micro shifts create macro impact. But another gentleman that was there is a gentleman named Kobe Huberman, who is my co-author. And Kobe was there. I, last night you heard about open source technology. He facilitates open space technology, which is a facilitation technique to use in polar situations. So in 2005, he was talking about how he was using his uh, open space technology to create relationships in Israel, because he lives in Tel Aviv, between Israelis and Arabs. And he was talking about that that was how he was trying to make impact, was through fac facilitating conversations with polarity, where the only thing they had in common was they didn't want their sons to die in battle. And, and what he's doing now is incredible. He has a company called The Empathy Group, and what they're using is music and, music and food and conversation to create compassion. And so I, I want to uh, let you know that everything else I'm going to talk about from here on out is really created by the friendship and the synergy that Kobe and I have had. And I really think it's very important that he is here today. Um, Anais Nin has this wonderful quote that, that says that a new world is born when two people meet. And, and I really feel that having met him, um, it was just a beautiful chemistry that transformed both of us. And if we're lucky in any way, that chemistry will transform you as well. All right, so now I'm going to begin. And I want to let you know that this, um, this ex Bill's team is so generous that they are going to put a YouTube video up. Um, they're going to have access to my slides and a transcript by Monday. So I really want you to relax and really enjoy this. And everything I'm talking about here is also further detailed in our book as well. Okay. So I was talking last night, and the, the topic of storytelling came up. And I think you as leaders have to be incredible at storytelling. And one of the most important things that we have to do is how do we create context for people. So I'm going to begin by telling you where we've been. And then I'm going to tell you where we're going. And then I'm going to invite you to ask yourself what's required. I, I do think the first gift I want to give to you of the five is that those three questions are really important. Where have we been? Where are we going? And what's required? Okay. So where have we been? So we took a look at the past about 100 years of businesses and, and different business models. And so I'm going to go way up high and then go down to you. So if you think about it, from 1850, we call it the F organization. And as you can see, there are F for farms, families, and fortunes. There was a single core competency, and most of this actually was either um, patriarchal, and there was a sense of lifetime employment. From 1940 to 1970, we have what's called the S organization. And the S stands for, really, stability, or structure and security. And what occurred here is that stability was the key, and then leadership became hierarchical. 
Okay, this is very, very important. It's really relatively recent if you think about it, 1940 to now. Um, and if you can think about world wars, you know, you, there's a lot of reasons why. But it, it, it became hierarchical because at that time that was wise. Seniority became valued and then the focus began to be efficiency. Okay. From 1970 to 1995, we have what we'll call the P organization, which stood for really, as you can see, products, performance, and profit. And this is when we got really good at policies and procedures. This is where the MBA rose. And this is where something happened that was fundamental. For the first time in our history, systems became more important than people. If only it had been systems as important of, I think we would be in a very different place. But truly, from 1970 to 1995, it was really about these things, products, performance, and profits. From 1995 to 2002, we then went to what was called the e-organization, of course, and the, the e-business, e-commerce, everyone can play. I remember I was, um, I was a manager at a 200-person call center at the time the internet came up, and we actually went to, it was at Frontier, we're now Global Communications, and we went to and learned how to surf the net. And I remember, like, why would someone want to surf the net? This is ridiculous. Surfing, that's for the beach, you know. So it's just so interesting. You know, at that time as well, we only had two cell phones. We, as managers, could deploy for emergency situations, and we had to decide if it was, you know, a, a pregnant woman or a new person that was trying to find a job, who gets that cell phone? So, you know, it's just even in my lifetime, it's just amazing the changes. So the e-organization, as you know, is the electronic evolution, revolution. And, and the biggest E here is that everyone can play. Okay. All right. So I've taken you at a high level where we've been. And now, if I, can I get the lights, please? Now I'm going to share with you where we're going.
Lights, please. I feel, I feel like um, I had a vision when I was eight years old and um, had an experience, experience of um, a real great sense of purpose since I was eight years old. And actually, you seeing the video today is very meaningful for me because it's, um, it's been a responsibility on my shoulders for quite a while. And I don't want to die, but if I do die, I think I can. Um, and so if, you know, if you've ever been to that feeling, it feels good to know that. The first tool I gave you was the question, where have we been, where are we going, and what's required? The second tool I gave you was the idea of, um, of finding an accountability partner. What I didn't tell you, out of the 118 people that were there at the conference at Form 21, the only person I talked to who had an action plan about their role to take everything they learned back to their community was Kobe. And Kobe and I, um, you know, I, I had a plan like that. And everyone else I talked to was having fun. Isn't this beautiful? It's in France. Well, you know, and, and there's just this urgency around, you know, we're responsible here to take this information back. This wasn't for us. We're conduits for this information. And, and so just by virtue of him having this action plan, we had dinner together. And then for the next three years, we had Skype calls. And he was gracious enough to do it on my time at 5 AM to 7 every two weeks for three years. We never intended to write a book. What we did was we were accountability partners on what we were learning and what we were challenged with. And what we did was we audio taped and then had transcribed those calls. And what happened was, after a period of about two years, it was very clear that there was an emergent pattern, that everything that we were talking about fit into three distinct categories. There was strategy, business strategy, fundamentals. Then there was leadership. And then there was, who were we as leaders? The soul. And, and so I just want to say, like, we never intended to write a book. The book kind of wrote itself. But the kind of, you know, like, I know you're meeting people here that you have a lot in common with and that you enjoy. I invite you to find the person that is the remote, or remote, most remote from you to build some sort of continuity in your relationship. And if not here in this conference with someone, someone else. In a global environment, you need to have someone who has a different vantage point to help inform you of the macro. And so I, the second thing I give to you is that invitation to find an accountability partner to learn and grow with. Okay. Thank you. All right, let's get back to business, right? All right, so there's a lot of different business models, and um, there's the balance scorecard and all that jazz. The, the business model that, that we use is one similar here, and I'm going to go clockwise. So most businesses, and even colleges, they have, they have a brand, an articulation of what it, they are the best at, what degrees are the best for you to get from here. Then there's KPIs, key performance indicators, and then there's relationships. And for you as the CIO, you have the alumni, the staff, the community relations. You have the core competency, what you're the best at. You have the finance and the knowledge management. And at the epicenter, I think Linda yesterday used the word access, access, right? At the access, at the epicenter, is really the CIO. No other function is so strategically integral than that of the CIO. You're at the epicenter of every single aspect of the business. Who else do the provost, president, faculty, staff, and students depend on? With all those people relying on you for functionality, how can you move from being server-centric to service-centric? Let me ask that question again. With all those people relying on you for functionality, how can you move from being server-centric to service-centric? I'm hopeful that from the concept of transorganization that you might have an idea. You work in a bio-organization, okay? It's alive. <laughs> You're a tough crowd. You're a really tough crowd, I gotta say. It's alive, I repeat, okay. Um, I, I know like, this is more of a synapse than a capillary system, but the, the metaphor that I have been using and I'd like you to use is the idea that you're a capillary system. And I'm not in any way um, an expert in anatomy. And this is incomplete as a metaphor. And I look forward to learning from you as you chew on it for a while, if you want to chew on it for a while, how you can help me better explain it from a CIO's perspective, what I mean by capillary system. 
So yeah, this is what I say. There's an imperfect metaphor, and I know there are functions and details about capillaries that I'm not prepared to teach or defend. But here's how I'd like to look at it. You're pervasive throughout the entire educational ecosystem. You foster information exchange and connectivity. You keep in the good stuff coming in, creating stronger networks, and you work vigilantly to keep out toxins to, to really create vitality for the whole. Okay, that's as far as I'm prepared to talk about <laughs> from a capillary perspective. But I just wondered, like, does it shift for you to think of yourself as managing servers to actually being integral to every aspect of the ecosystem? Does that do anything for your mindset? Okay. All right. So then I go back to protection. Every great athlete, every great competitor knows that in order to prepare for battle or to prepare for a contest, that you have to do great conditioning. And part of that conditioning is knowing how do you rest? How do you protect yourself to make sure that you don't get an injury, right? And so if, if needing protection feels too feminine, you know, the idea is how can I keep myself in the best possible condition so that I have the endurance I need? That's what we're going to spend the rest of this time with. How much time do I have? I forgot to look. OK, fantastic. Great. Very good. All right. So now I'm going to go to, I'm going to dive into you and go into a little, little tiny bit on neuroscience. But I'm going to start with this. And it's real important. So we started it with context for business models. And now I'm going to go into context for power structures. And this is what I call the evolution of power. And, and it's really important because decisions are made by information and power structures. So, and it's a hierarchy, meaning everything that comes after is included plus what's next. So currently, the evolution of power was whoever was the strongest would win. And then it was whoever has the most mobility will win. The next era that is inclusive of all these others is the idea of either cash or gold and trade. Whoever has that ability will win. What's really interesting is that I, originally from Denver, I now live in Rochester, New York. We have Kodak, Bausch & Lomb, Xerox. We have all these monoliths of, you know, these infrastructure. So I'll go to whoever at one point had the infrastructure would certainly win. And where we then went was whoever has the knowledge, customer knowledge, you know. And, and this, to me, is a concern that as we get better at the cloud and get better at, at accessing data, Let's, let's keep in mind that there's, there's something in addition to knowledge that, that creates decision making. Um, and the, where we went from knowledge management was to what I'll call LinkedIn, the LinkedIn era, meaning you can be ugly and poor in a wheelchair. And because of who you know and are associated with, you will have as much power as someone who has all of those things. Okay? We live in an era of social capital. You can buy stock on me, by the way, on Twitter. And it, I'm not teasing. I'm, like, I'm serious that the whole way that there's clout scores now and, and people are hiring people based on certain metrics, on how many people do they know, how do we know they read their blogs. And it's terrifying for me. It, you know, it's important that we know how to play in that space. But it's important that we know it's not enough. Right? So as a bit of an edgy person and hopefully a little bit provocative, where I will tell you is that we're power will be brokered is in consciousness, okay? And I, I'm not saying conscientiousness, okay? I go back to that quote about wisdom and technology. Whoever has the most knowledge of how their own psychology and mind works, or whoever has the knowledge of their customer's mind will win, okay? Marketers are, you know, companies are hiring anthropologists and sociologists. They're not doing M MRI brain scans when they're having customers do product reviews. Leaders have to use the same technology in how do you grow your people to have the kind of wisdom that they need to, to combat all these pieces of data that actually have more power on our unconscious than our conscious has on what's really good for us. So if you can imagine, I do have a hard time sleeping at night because of these things. So 
you know, when I told you that I was a, a manager of a 200-person call center, we used to share phone, uh, sell phone features. And so if we could get you to get call waiting and caller ID, that would be wallet share because we'd get more of your wallet. And so after showing you that consciousness is where the power will be, I want you to think of that your, your competitive advantage isn't what you do. And your competitive advantage isn't where you do what you do. It is your mind share. And, and that, you know, I really believe that, that how you think and your level of awareness and your ability to accurately scan the macro environment and respond to it, that is your competitive advantage. As individuals, where you choose to use that awareness is your business. But your advantage, your competitive advantage is, is your mind and how you protect it and how you use it. Okay. I know, swim to the surface a little bit. My daughter, who I did this for, my oldest daughter, she's 14, and when she was 10 years old, I drew this picture for her. And it was the first time, and you know as a parent, you begin to know when they know better, or when they need to know, they always will have other options to make a decision, right? And so I have no idea how much therapy all three of my children will need when they're older. But, um, but I, I did, you know, she made a decision that I felt was a dangerous one for her, and I wanted her to know that she probably had more choices available to her, and I didn't want her to feel bad. I just wanted her to say, you know, when you're in a situation like that, can you always just ask yourself, what is the other solution that I haven't thought of yet? So I drew this picture for her, and, and so, you know, you are complex. You have values, thoughts, beliefs, goals, fear, and data all going on, and then, you're asked to kick the ball. Did that come? I want it to be loud, right? Because the word decide comes from the Latin casera, to cut. And also, some people say also from the Greek to kill. Homicide, suicide, decide came from the same root. So when you choose, you kill all other possibilities, right? What many people are unaware of is that your conscious brain processes four. 40 bits per second. So you process 40 bits of information per second. Your subconscious, your unconscious, processes 4 million bits per second. Okay. So there's a filter that, so, you know, because you'd be catatonic. I'm getting too much information. I can't move, right? So you have to find a way to say, I need just enough to, to make a decision, kick the ball. And by the way, this is a soccer analogy, and can we just be so excited of the women's team who won the World Cup last night? Yes! Yay! Yay! So, um, so, so this analogy, I think, is great, because when you're working with other people, you're in play. You're on a field, and your job is to figure out what is my role and where is the ball, right? And so, so the filter, again, 40 bits per second consciously, 4 million bits unconsciously, right? And what, what some people don't realize is that neurons that fire together wire together in that, you know, if you think of your brain like a glacier, and that as you begin to make decisions and, and repetitive patterns, there tends to be a groove that over time becomes more like a canyon, right? And, and the terrifying thing is, and um, I have been deeply influenced by Noam Chomsky, who's a linguist. And so if you, if you want to go and do a deeper dive in this space, feel free. It's fascinating, fascinating. What most people don't realize is that when they chose their thin slice, it was between the ages of five and seven. Because five and seven years old is when you begin to have the capacity to make up a story with yourself as the hero or heroine. And you begin to say things like, I am lovable because I'm smart. I'm lovable because I fix things. I'm lovable because I make people laugh, right? And then you begin to make decisions based on seeing the criteria around how can I be safe and belong? And as you do that, you begin to make connections that get reinforced, even if they're inaccurate, okay? Even if they're inaccurate, you will find the data, because it's there, that will reinforce those patterns, okay? So, so one question is, have you been introspective, or can you be introspective to say, as I've designed my thin slice, is it a pattern from the past? Or is it really the best possible filter for my long view? So this is, this is heavy stuff. I hope you had some coffee. 
before this. I was telling someone the other night that, you know, I hope, I hope that you either bring tissue or Tylenol, because I sometimes give people a headache, and sometimes I do make people cry, and I don't mean to, but, so I hope you're doing okay. How are we doing on time? Doing good? Okay, very good. All right. All right, so the next three tools I'm going to give you are going to be tools to help you know mo more about yourself, so that as you're that lighthouse, you will better understand your mind share and make wiser decisions. So that's where we're gonna spend the remaining time. So if it's true you're in the soccer field of play, it's really important that you take care of your sense-making system, right? However it is that you get information. So I put you at the epicenter here. And, and I, I'd like you to be reflective around, you know, the, if, if our goal is to sense the environment with as much accuracy as possible. And I think it's really, really important that you have a dashboard for yourself, a business model for yourself, that allows you to take better care of your sensory perception. And, and you know, any, you know, this is it. Let's get the business aisle and the self-help aisle in the same book because any, any self-help book you go to is gonna have a model very similar to this. You're at the epicenter. I'm gonna start at the top and go clockwise. Spirituality is not religion, it's that if you, in fact, think your life makes a difference, the way you will see reality will have a different lens to it. And it might, I believe it will be more accurate because usually if you think you can make a difference, you, you tend to give people eye contact and you, you tend to have your eyes a little higher and you tend to be scanning the environment, right? So, so knowing that you make impact and that you belong to a bigger picture is important to access reality. Then we go to health and wellness. You as CIOs cannot neglect your physical body. You have to design in your exercise. You have to take care. I'm concerned about your blood pressure, right? I haven't, I haven't done any deep research. Some, some groups I do research on what type of illnesses do certain positions have. Um, I haven't done the research for you in, in the CIO, but I'm sensing that you're really technical EMTs, right? So I'm concerned about your heart. In your blood pressure. But please, if you really care about the systems you're designing, please take better care of yourself. It's, it's vital. It's really vital that you do that. Relationships, intimacy, the, the more you experience intimacy outside of work, the more, re, re, the more you can actually handle criticism within work or also give people more accurate feedback because other needs are being met in a different place so that you can actually be more fully present at work. Okay, important. Now, this is where I get people in the definition that I use, and not everyone uses this. Emotional well-being is your ability to embrace your talent without pride and your inadequacy without shame. Because if, in fact, you have too much pride, it really means that you feel inadequate in a different place. And if you feel inadequate in a different place, you actually might overcompensate in, in another area that won't be valuable. So it's really important that you know you're incredibly talented in some areas, and in some areas you're not so talented. And, and to be honest about that, if you're given a task that you're not good at, say, I'm not talented enough here to support the system. And it's not that I'm, do, I'm not neglecting it, it's that I want to be you know, honest about how I can truly contribute. But the first person you have to tell that kind of truth to is yourself. Okay. Then we go to finance. You know, I think of money like oxygen, like blood flow. It's just an energy circulation. And I know, especially in the nonprofit world, boy, they talk about money. They're like, nobody wants to talk about money in nonprofit. You're a capitalist, right? It's really important that people take care of their finances. It's really important that they treat it like a key indicator and know, know your number. Even if you're in debt, know your number. Know the truth. It will, if you don't, it will impact the way you see reality and you might not make the wisest decisions in other areas. And then, and then finally, intellect. And I, I have this vision that, that I, I go on an airplane, oh, well, never mind, people are gonna be like, oh my God, if you see Jennifer coming, make sure you have your courtesy book so no, she won't start talking to you. But my vision is that every person that I meet says they have three things they're working on. One is a core competency on the job in which they were hired to get mastery at. The second is a core competency on either leadership or teamwork. And then the, the third is an anticipatory skill set. Meaning, like if I look at the macro, I need to begin practicing 
another skill set because these themes are important. You know, so that everyone would have a current skill set to master, an emergent skill set to learn, and one team, teamwork or leadership attribute. That would be my, my fantasy. So I hope you're seeing a pattern here, is that the business model and the interpersonal model are actually one and the same. Brand and spirituality, sensory information and health and wellness, collective stakeholder experience and relationship, core business clarity and emotional well-being, financial sensors and finance, and knowledge management and intellect. Okay. It's really important that you look at how can you actually inter, you know, create together synergy between your own life dashboard and whatever business dashboard you're working in. It's, it's simple, but it's so, so challenging to execute. So one of the ways to help you arm yourself and prepare yourself is an assignment that I'm going to give you. But before I give you the assignment, well, I'll ask you right now. You don't have to tell me now, but what I'd love you to think about are two personal accomplishments. They can either be personal or business. That if you look at your life in a rearview mirror, that you're the most proud of. Okay, so two accomplishments that you're the most proud of. And what I, what I want you to do is I want you to find some sort of physical symbol to represent that that you're the most proud of. Okay. And the, the most, in our culture, we don't have a lot of symbolism that gives us the kind of tribal power that a lot of cultures have in, in the Western world. I think, I think we really need to do a better job of really honoring symbolism that is really significant symbolism that isn't about car and breast size and wallet size, but real deep, you know, who, you know, what is your icon? What is your icon? I want to read you this poem. It's from uh, Sir John Hunt in The Last Blue Mountain. The true result of endeavor, whether on a mountain or in any context, may be found in the lasting effects rather than the moments during which the summit is trampled. The real measure is the success or failure of the climber not to triumph over a mountain, but over oneself. The true value of the enterprise lies in the example to others of human motivation and human contact. Okay. So I have for you two symbols that are meaningful for me. One is a dolphin and one is this globe. The most meaningful call that I got from a client was a gentleman that was in his 50s that was kind of saying, Jen, I don't get this tribal crap. And literally that's what he said, I don't get this tribal crap. I don't see an icon. I don't know what you're talking about. I got a phone call from him about two months later, and he said, Jennifer, I was on vacation with my family, and my daughter ordered a tiki drink, and they gave her a straw with a giraffe in it. And I started to get goosebumps and to tear up when I saw the giraffe. He said, in my family, there was a lot of abuse, and I protected my two siblings. And I'm the risk manager of a company. And so no matter where I've been, I've been the protector. And when I saw the giraffe, I saw that what I am is a giraffe. And I look and see danger and protect people. So if an icon doesn't come to you immediately and you don't really see that tattoo that you've always wanted, right? I'm sure that if you really put it as a query, that, that sometime, and it might be a year from now, it might be next week, that, that something significant will emerge. In our house, if it gets too hot, our air conditioning turns on. If it gets too cold, the heat turns on. It happens without me thinking about it. I think sometimes we as leaders forget that we need wind in our sail. And when we have symbols in our workspace, unconsciously, they give us a boost when we don't know we need one. That's why that's assignment number three. If you notice from the video, we had a thumbprint, a fingerprint, and there's something really sick about me because I love CSI. I love the idea that you can actually see a movie about someone that killed someone. 20 years later, they can find the guy because of evidence that's left behind. And um, I don't know if you can see. Oh, good, you can see it. I couldn't see it at first. There's that thumbprint there. I would like us to begin to think earlier about legacy because every interaction that we have leaves residue. And so, 
what I'd like you to think about is if, if w really I'd like you to think about like what is left in your wake. And I ask people to think about three attributes that they hope that they leave behind. And I'll share with you, it was in 2008 that I started to say, you know, I want to leave behind wisdom, grace, and impact. I'm not always wise. I'm not always graceful. I'm not always impactful. But I am more so because I desire to leave that behind. And I write in my journal once a week, where have I been wise, graceful, and impactful? And where was there room for more? There's something about writing that. And my judgment, I'm not judgmental when I write it. I'm really like, hey, what am I learning? And where can I be more of those things? When I die, I hope they say I was a wise, impactful, and graceful person. OK, I'm 42 years old. I hope to be 100. But I want each of you, if you're going into a macro environment that's changing, in augmented reality, they say the hardest thing is for people to prove who they really are. How are you going to prove who you really are if you don't know who you really are, right? So, you know, and again, you, you, you probably have your list of this yourself. Choose three and begin to practice. And begin to practice. Now, I work with people who say, Jennifer, I haven't a clue. I'm lost. So no worries, right? Because we are who we are because of reflections. So an exercise, the exercise number four I want to leave you with is who are your elite 18? Who are 18 people at a global level? They don't have to be famous, but I'm saying there's no boundary. There's no socioeconomic boundary. There's no, there's no distance boundary. Who are 18 people that you hope to meet in your lifetime? Okay. Get a picture of those people in front of you, because again, our unconscious brain actually works with images more than text. And, and talk to someone else, or call me and say, Jennifer, what is the pattern? Because I've always been able to assess the three from looking at people's Elite 18. And also, envy. If you envy someone or are jealous of someone, what that means is that there's something in you that's dormant that you have the capacity for. So people you admire, people you envy, get them 18, 18, shot, 18 shots in a whiskey bottle, 18 holes on a golf course. 18 is a number of life in the Jewish tradition. 18. Who are your elite 18? Okay. And if there aren't 18 people at a global level you want to meet, it's time that someone asks you to think about it. Right? Okay. The last thing I'm going to give you is a, a concept, um, concept that came from. Um, at one point, I was working with 27 CEOs in different roundtables. And what I did is I looked at where do people spend their physical time? Because where people spend their physiology is the truth of what they value, right? And so Kobe and I were talking about companies that we felt were really progressive and what we would call trans-organizational, more prepared for change, versus traditional. And what we found, there was a significant shift, and again, this is all in the book, um, that, that if you notice the left-hand side, 35% of the time was handling internal meetings, 30% handling internal communication, 15% fire reactivity, 12% meeting customers, 5% reflection time, 3% designing, inventing, and creating. Okay? If things are happening in synchronous time, you have to shift the capacities. Okay? So it isn't about have this model, plug and play. It's that can you look at where you're spending your time and can you create more space, particularly if you can see here, um, that at least 20% of your time should be spent in customer-constituent interactions. And 15% and of the time should be really in inventing and creating. And then 18% should really be in reflection. Okay? And I really want to make a mental distinction here. Reading information and learning and going to lectures is input. It's not reflection. Okay, use different parts of the brain when you're learning than when you're actually uh, tapping into your own deep wisdom. So in terms of capacity modeling, I actually separate them out. I, se I separate them out. So I think about, um, it seems as if we need scarcity to make wise choices. So it's an imperfect model again, but I want you to think about, you have 200 joules of energy a month to deploy in a work situation. I mean, if you, if you are spending more than 200 <coughs> hours a month on work issues, you need a life. 
you need to go to the gym, you need to join a club, <laughs> right? And so the buckets, and, and, and we have, in, in my world, we have 18-month calendars and 90-day calendars, and we design our capacity in those windows. I believe if you realize that it was a scarce resource, like your systems that you're facilitating, they have true capacity limits, that if you designed those in and treated yourself, it's ironic, I think you'll treat yourself more humane if you treat yourself like a system, right? But these are the buckets, you know, internal relationships, external relationships, administration, finance resource management, strategy or scenario, visioning, and then, and then reflection. Okay. So th that is the last gift, was the idea of treating yourself with 200 joules a month to deploy and doing what you can to forecast where you will spend yourself versus spending yourself based on what's emergent. And there's a process to do that and get there. So resilience is, the practice is, what iconic image can honor your life journey? Responsiveness practice is, how can you better buffer your own capacity to ensure that you're responsive? Okay? What I didn't talk about in those 200 watts is to be sure to leave some capacity for open space by design, that you protect not as space in case I need an emergency, but open space is open space, okay? And I don't know how many of you have heard theory, just by show of hands, Theory U, the whole Presencing Institute? Okay, there's work to be done, Bill. I'll help you out with that. Okay, all right. And then reflection, which is really how, how can you take better care of your own personal dashboard? If you're making these decisions, you, you have to make sure your sensory system is healthy and vital and that you're taking care of yourself in many, many ways that you're probably not because you're such great, kind, conscientious caretakers. Your caretaking's gonna kill us, okay? Someone frowned in the audience, I guess, what does she mean by that? Sometimes by being thoughtful, you actually injure the system because it requires your heroic activity to make it work. Therefore, it's not a sustainable system if it requires your energy and your life to make it run. I am really a nice person. That didn't sound very nice, did it? The tone was a little tough there. Sorry about that. Okay, so I'm gonna leave you with this last message. This is not the age of information. This is not the age of information. This is the age of resonance. And with that, I thank you. One minute. If you'll notice from my presentation, I began today with acknowledgement. I'm going to end today with acknowledgement. I don't think in our culture we do enough gracious acknowledgement. Bill, I want to tell you, my, my, I have three kids that might come here. Behaviorally, from the time you invited me to speak to the, where's uh, Delphine, is she around? Wherever she is. To her fixing a typo for me, right before my talk and calling me and saying, Jen, it's fixed. The level of follow through and one point contact of your team has been remarkable. I thank you so much for that. Where's Jean? Jean Casares, RIT. This woman from my community, RIT, uh, really recommended my book and Bill, you read it based on her recommendation. Thank you, because I wouldn't be here if you didn't do that. Where's Frank? Frank, I hope you all get a chance to meet him. He's the CIO of the American Museum of Natural History. He's someone I interviewed, and I, I couldn't, I was like, I felt like I was having coffee with him, and I just, I can't wait to continue just an amazing conversation, which was great. Where's Gary? Ah, we're going to roast Gary. Okay. <laughs> Do let him know I said the most wonderful things about what I learned from him in the CIO role, right? He probably went to the pub last night with some people. Did he go to the pub with you? No, it didn't meet Gary. Okay, very good. Um, Mark Reed couldn't be here, and I did everything I could to say, you need the open space. You know, I tried so hard, but um, he's also another wonderful person that I hope you do know, and if you don't know, I hope you get a chance to meet him. Um, he's the Associate VP of Binghamton University. I also, I really need to say that I came from the University of Colorado. I got two degrees, complete degrees, in four and a half years, and I paid for my own education at University of Colorado, a degree in existential philosophy and in English. I was an RA, as well as an academic advisor. And uh, I can't say enough about how prepared I was. And I, by the way, did get to meet Thomas Friedman. I did get to interview him. 
And I asked him, I said, what is it that you're teaching your own children to help them prepare for tomorrow? And he said two words, passion and curiosity. He said, Jennifer, so long as my children have passion and curiosity, they'll navigate anything they need to to be successful. So that was really wonderful, and I want to thank University of Colorado for giving me such a great desire to learn and be curious. And then, um, actually, I'm a big believer in mentors. I think that every person should both mentor someone and have a mentor. And believe it or not, my mentor is in the back. His name is Max Carey, and uh, he's taught me so much. And I hope, I hope I've done some justice to you uh, in terms of me representing what I've learned from a master. I call him a transleader, because when I designed what are the attributes of a transleader, I studied the, the, the people that I really felt had the ability to adapt at the pace of change. And so he certainly is a transleader. Um, the video that you saw was actually done by Josh Pies, a friend of his and myself. And I was like Barbara Streisand in how to control that video. But I, I just think it's amazing on a shoestring what we were able to accomplish. And I just think he's really, really gifted. And then Brian Kenny is just a, a really delightful graphic artist. And he, he helped me fix and modernize. I, I tend to care more about the ideas than how they're presented, and I know that to be successful, I've got to do a better job of that. But uh, thank you. I'm done. OK. Oh, OK. So sorry. Look at me. Such a ham. Okay, we're going to give Jennifer a nice award for, for coming to speak with us, and then afterwards we're going to have a break, so I would encourage everyone to go talk to the vendors who so nicely sponsored this event and get to meet them a little bit, and there's coffee and donuts and treats up there too. So uh, we'll see you back when the session begins. <laughs>